Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. On today's broadcast, Andrew will be sharing about the importance of having a biblical worldview. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, we have another very special program lined up for you, and we are going to continue our teaching on biblical worldview concerning sexuality. I tell you, this is an area that is really under attack, biblical sexuality. You know, God's one that created sex. He gave it to mankind in a sinless state. It's not evil, but the way it's been perverted is evil. And so we have this series on biblical worldview. Yesterday, I had Alex McFarland share, uh, and he's an expert in this area. And today, we've got Pastor Dwayne Sheriff. I tell you, I love Dwayne and Sue Sheriff. He's on my board of directors. In my estimation, he's one of the best ministers on the planet. He not only gets the truth across, but he does it in an entertaining way. And he's going to be talking about the purpose of marriage. If you don't understand the purpose of something, you're going to misuse it. And people have totally misused the sexual relationship outside of marriage. It is polluted because they don't understand. I tell you, this is going to help you tremendously. So listen as Pastor Dwayne Sheriff shares on biblical worldview on sexuality, the purpose of marriage. And at the end of the program, I'm going to come on and share with you how you can get the rest of his teaching. This is only a portion of what he'll be sharing. Hi, I'm Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, and I'm excited about this series and being a part of it. In this particular session, I'm going to deal with the purpose of marriage, the purpose of marriage, because this series, again, is approaching the issues of life from either a secular worldview or a biblical worldview. And unfortunately, even within the church today, many believers do not have a biblical worldview of the institution of marriage. And if you haven't figured it out yet, marriage and the institution itself is under assault from all kinds of venues today. And God's people need to be informed specifically and have a biblical worldview. But I believe even people who don't know the Lord, God wants them to be married. And marriage is a gift we're going to see to humanity. And God wants even people who don't know Him or are going to serve Him to have a biblical view of the institution of marriage. Because if you don't know the purpose of a thing, I promise you, whatever the thing is, you're going to be confused, frustrated, and unintentionally abuse the purpose of a thing. Everything has a purpose, and marriage is no different. And yet many of us have never been taught what is the purpose of marriage. I want to start from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm reading my Bible on my phone. It's important that you know that I'm not on Facebook or uh, checking my emails, but that I have different translations downloaded onto my phone, and that helps me look at different scriptures and translations to find the spirit of what God is saying. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under the heaven. Everything has a purpose. And again, we must know that purpose or we're going to abuse a thing. Now, in my next session, I'm going to talk about who created marriage and I'm going to get into the covenant of marriage. But I'm just going to make some statements in this session and then I'll look at Scripture in the next session. But God is the creator of marriage. And Like any creation, whether it's a creation of God or a creation of man, it's the Creator that knows the purpose of the creation. A created thing doesn't know its purpose. The Creator knows the purpose. A car doesn't know its purpose. My my Toyota doesn't know its purpose. It's a creation, and Toyota knows the, the purpose and has a manual for the purpose of the car. You know, I visit this campus a lot. 
This is a tremendous ministry. I'm so honored to be a part of Andrew and Jamie's lives and ministry and, and Karis. And we've been under construction for years. There's not anywhere you can go in this ministry that we're not under construction. And there could be a contractor or a carpenter that would need to find a hammer, and there's a purpose to a hammer. And if he's behind or she's behind the stage and can't find a hammer, but there's a guitar right there on the stage, it is possible to take a guitar and a 16-penny nail and drive it into a two before. But that's not the purpose of the guitar. And if you use a guitar to drive a 16-penny nail into a two before, you may get her done, but you're abusing the guitar and you're frustrating the original purpose of the guitar. Not to mention the owner of it's going to have a, a need for an attitude adjustment. I can tell you that for sure. Bottom line is, I went into marriage not having a biblical perspective of the purpose of marriage. And it's only because Sue and I were so committed to Jesus and committed to the Word of God that today we are happily, productively married, bearing fruit on every level of our lives. Because I didn't have a biblical worldview of marriage. I didn't even realize that I had nothing but a secular worldview of marriage. And so if I hadn't have known the Word and, and discovered God's purpose in the Word, I could have frustrated my own marriage and the purpose, the purpose of marriage. When I began in ministry, I was pastoring in the Methodist church and I was a young pastor. I was hungry for, for knowledge and not only God's view, God's philosophy, God's way of thinking, God's way of living life. I was hungry for that. I thought everybody else was. And so I, I would ask questions and even of people in the congregation because I was a young pastor and I was pastoring a congregation that was chronologically, if you will, challenged. They were quite a bit older than me. And so I thought wisdom was found in, in age. And uh, boy, was that a rude awakening. But the bottom line is I was seeking information even as a pastor on marriage and the purpose of marriage. And so I visited many people in the congregation that had been married at least 20, 40, some 60 years. I talked to people that were married for 60 years. And I may not have asked the question properly. I'll admit that again. I was young. I was new. and uh, But I just simply would go and visit people and say, why did you get married? Why did you get married? And I was shocked at the responses that I got. And all I learned and all I discovered is they were as confused as I was in the purpose of marriage. I even, even caused hesitation in some people that had been married for 40 years. I would say, well, why did you get married? And they would try to think. And then they would go, yeah, why did I get married? As if I was questioning their marriage and they began to question their marriage. That wasn't my purpose. My purpose was to discover the purpose of marriage. And so at that point, Sue and I really began to dig in because I realized I wasn't the only one that hadn't been taught a biblical perspective. So let me just give you some quick results of my survey. I'm going to give you the top four secular worldviews that even Christians were presenting to me. And remember, this was almost 40 years ago. How more confused is this generation than even that generation. And so I'm, gonna, I'm only going to highlight these because uh, you can take almost an hour on each one from a secular worldview. And where does this come from? And how damaging is it? And many of the other speakers are just doing a fantastic job of sharing different worldviews and the consequences of not having a biblical worldview concerning the major issues, especially of, of life. So here are the top four. I'll highlight them, and then I want to give you the top five biblical purposes of marriage. So let's do the secular first. Number one, the number one answer that I got nearly 40 years ago and that is still prevalent today, I would ask people, why did you get married? They would say to, to be happy. To be happy. Uh, how's that working out for you? When you enter marriage thinking the purpose is for another human being to make you happy, you have set yourself up for unhappiness. No human being can be the source 
of our happiness. And while God wills for Sue and I to be happily married, I can't look to Sue or any other person as the source of my happiness. And so many marriages are collapsing and people are frustrated, confused, and now abuse is happening because they're demanding that their spouse make them happy. No spouse can make you happy. Only faith, obedience in God can make you happy. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Where there's no vision, the people perish, but happy is he that keeps the law. Think about that. Happy is the man that operates in faith obedience to God's Word. Happiness comes from doing things God's way. Happiness comes from obeying God. Anything God tells you is for your good, not your harm. God's not being mean when He tells us don't do certain things. He knows if you'll do what I tell you to do, if you'll think like I think, and my Word will teach you how to think, and if you'll go my way, not the ways of the world, you'll be happy. Job literally said, and I've, I've given you the references, you can look all this up because again, I have to hurry. But Job said, happy is the man whom the Lord corrects. Boy, that's different thinking. Who thinks like that? Who believes that, man, happiness comes from God correcting me? How could that be so? No one wants to be corrected after the flesh, but happiness comes from God correcting us because if I stay on a path that is sin, it's going to lead to death. And unhappiness is a part of death. But if I let God correct my thinking, adjust how I think, the way I think, the way I view things, see things how He sees things, then in doing things God's way, I'll be blessed and prosperous. And that's a part of being happy. Psalms 127 talks about how children are the heritage of the Lord. Children are precious. Children are valuable. Children are an awesome part of marriage and literally are the heritage of the Lord. And the Bible says, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Boy, I got good friends will disagree with that. <laughs> Some people just the thought of having one kid, they quiver. A quiver is um, what holds arrows. And the average quiver in the time this was written, held five arrows. And so God's saying having five kids is a part of happiness. Being a servant to children, raising up a generation and a godly seed will bring happiness into my life. And so I know a lot of people even struggle with that, even as Christians. But I gave you a lot of references. There's other teachings that I and others have on this that you can access on how God and and looking to God and faith obedience to God is what brings happiness, not a spouse. Don't get married to be happy. Get happy serving God. Find somebody else happy serving God and enjoy your happiness together. All right, number two. Number two secular world, world view that was presented to me was people got married to find their value or worth. Think about that. They got married and they thought this person will bring value to me and, and, and worth to me. I will feel better about myself. It will help my esteem. Here's someone that will commit to me in marriage and I'm getting married to increase my value or my worth. Let me just, let me cut to the chase on this. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19, God reveals the source of our value and our worth. And how do you know what something's worth? How do you know about any creation, even of man, what is the value of it? What is the worth? Well, market forces determine that and basically though the cost. Some things cost more than others because we have deemed it more valuable or more worthy. And so the price, the cost determines the value, if you will, or the worth of a creation. What is my worth and my value as a creation created by Father God? First Peter chapter 1 again says that we were not bought. God didn't buy us back. God didn't bring us back. He didn't reconcile us with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. What did it cost God to save me? What did it cost God to love the whole world and to make a way of eternity with Him available? A way for sins to be not only forgiven and washed, but for us to be reconciled back to God. What did it cost God? It cost the life of His Son. Never let anyone underestimate your value and never look to anyone for your value. God paid 
the life of Jesus for your eternal soul. That's how much you're worth. That's your value. And if you look to God for your value, you will have a healthy esteem. You will, we, you will be able to deal with insecurities and on and on I could go. We could just spend literally hours on this. But the bottom line is many people get married to look to another person to bring value to them. And that is a secular worldview, not a biblical worldview. All right, number three in my survey, and I, I fell victim to this as well because just because I went to church doesn't mean I was taught the Bible. And a lot of people go to church and they think that's all it takes and that you need, but you need the Word of God. And you need to go to a church that's teaching the Word of God. But I had this concept of that Sue would complete me that somehow or another without Sue or without marriage, I was incomplete. So if you ask people, why do you get married? What's the purpose of marriage? Well, to complete me in, in saying that a single person is somehow or another incomplete and that it takes, again, another human being, even in the institution of marriage, to complete us or make us whole. Somehow or another, for instance, the Apostle Paul wasn't complete. The Apostle Paul never married. He had the gift, a gift of, of celibacy, if you will. He had a gift in regards to his sexuality, and uh, he wasn't incomplete. He wasn't lacking in any way in his relationship with God and in his humanity even. And so we don't get married to complete us. While Sue compliments me and I her, while we enhance one another, uh, while there's a synergy in our covenant of of, of marriage, while there's this power in our diversity, in unity, Sue doesn't complete me. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says that we are complete in Jesus, who is the head of all principality and power. We are complete and made complete, made whole, spirit, soul, and body in, in faith in God, not faith in a spouse. We are made whole. We are complete in Jesus and looking to Jesus, not looking to another human being for my wholeness. That is a secular worldview that I had by default. Even though I went to church, I wasn't presented a biblical worldview of my identity with Jesus and my completeness in Him and how that only He can make me whole. There's the idea of somehow there's this completeness in marriage. And so that is a secular worldview versus a biblical worldview. All right, number four, and this will be our last one on the secular, uh, that astounded me. And I hear it all the time still to this day as a pastor, but people get married to get out of trouble. Holy cow, you got married to get out of trouble? Uh, it's amazing. The secular worldview of somehow or another people think entering into a marriage is going to solve all your problems. Marriage is not a trouble-free zone. It, it is not a, a institution that we don't have to pay constant attention to or work on or so to. No, the road to a healthy marriage is under constant construction. We, we are seeing marriages collapse mainly because of neglect today, even within the church. And we certainly are causing people to be frustrated in their marriages if you're looking to a spouse to get out of trouble. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is one of the references I gave you that Paul even mentioned that being single in many ways is better than being married. And he talked about being married, you will have trouble in the flesh. You're two different human beings coming together and merging into an institution and in a covenant of oneness, you're going to have things that you've got to work out and work through. And, and so it's not a trouble-free zone. And so we need to get that out of our head. So I could share a lot of other secular worldviews that we've all been subjected to, both saved and lost. But I, because of time here, need to look at then, all right, what is the biblical worldview of marriage? Why get married? Again, Paul, and I'll come back to this in the in the progression, but Paul did talk about that it, it, while it was good to be single, uh, it's not good to be single and burn with lust. And that if you, if you can't control your sexuality, you need to get married. And so I'll deal, I'll deal with that. Paul wasn't saying it's good to be single and fornicate. It's good to be single and, and, and commit sexual perversion and, and things of, of that nature. When he said that 
basically too, I wish that all men were as I, meaning being single. He's talking about being single and happy. He's talking about being single and complete. He's talking about being single. And if you have this gift uh, in regards to your sexuality, man, you can pour yourself into the things of God. And so that's a, that's a whole nother teaching as well. But let's look at the biblical worldview of the purpose of marriage. And so I'll begin in Genesis here, uh, chapter 2. And uh, let's just look at one passage to begin with. And then we'll, we'll go to some this account of the creation of marriage. We'll come back to it. But I just want to bring out one verse before I even read all of them. And so marriage is a construct of God. It is an institution created by God. Marriage was created as an institution before the, the government was created, before Israel was created, before the church was created. It's the oldest institution known to man created by God. And so when God creates the world and when God creates all within the world as the creator, of the creation, God and only God knows the purpose of a thing. So if God created marriage, and He did, according to Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and Jesus affirmed this in Mark chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, that God is the one that created us male and female. God is the one that created marriage. So He's created man here, and He's giving the account in Genesis chapter 2, and it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. So here we have the first, if you will, purpose of marriage was companionship, was intimate fellowship, was relationship. And again, I'll, I'll elaborate on this in my next session on the covenant of marriage. But God is the one that came up with the idea of marriage, not man. And isn't that awesome? I tell you, Pastor Dwayne is a great man of God and God is really using him. And I know that this touched you today and this was just a portion of his teaching on the purpose of marriage. So I encourage you to please get the rest of it. When you get this biblical worldview on sexuality, there's actually 10 different teachings in here by multiple teachers. There's also two hours worth of questions and answers. You get a study guide that covers all of the material. You get a USB that has all of the audio teaching on it, the panel and everything. And then you have access to our website where you can get all of the videos. And all of this is a part of this biblical worldview on sexuality. And then we are, have a package deal where you can get my original series on biblical worldview and then this one on sexuality as a combined gift. So listen to our announcer as he gives you that information and please call or write today. Today, Andrew's pleased to offer the next topic in the Biblical Worldview series titled Biblical Worldview Sexuality. In this series, Andrew's joined by Alex McFarland, Bill Federer, Dwayne Sheriff, Greg Moore, and Mike and Carrie Pickett as they outline the importance for every Christian believer to have a biblical worldview with regard to sexuality. Each of the 12 lessons includes a video, audio file, chapter lesson, and printable PDF wrapped in a single box set containing a workbook, audio USB, and personal access code to the online videos. Through the online platform, you'll have access to all of the videos and digital workbooks on your computer or smart device. You can get Biblical Worldview Sexuality today for only $120. Or you can receive Biblical Worldview Sexuality as part of the Biblical Worldview Package, which includes both installments from Andrew's Biblical Worldview series, Foundational Truths, and Sexuality. This package has a catalog value of $240, but you can get them both today for only $197. Go to awmi.net to order these valuable resources today. Many of you know that we have built a 1,022 space parking garage to accommodate all of our people that come to our facilities in Woodland Park. And it was at a $23 million cost and we are trying to get that paid off as quickly as we can. Though I felt like the Lord spoke to me about encouraging 
23,000 people to give a $1,000 offering, either a one-time gift or pledged out over a period of 10 months, $100 per month. If you would like to be a part of that, I encourage you to call or write, go to our website and join our 1K Club. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or you can call our helpline 24 hours a day, five days a week, Monday through Friday at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Welcome to the AWM Minute, a small glimpse on how our friends and partners are changing lives all around the world. Lives like Michael Schutz. All throughout his early childhood, Michael struggled with extreme food allergies and asthma. That is, until his parents found Andrew's teachings and healing journeys and learned for the first time ever that God wanted him well. I would watch video after video. I just knew, I'm like, if they are free from their ailments, <laughs> then my son can be free. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Schutzes stood on the promise that by the stripes of Jesus, their son was already healed, and within a few months, he had no more symptoms. Today, Michael is a healthy, athletic teenager who eats whatever he wants. To see his full healing journey, visit awmi.net today. And I want to share with you about Karis Distance Education. This is what we call our online platform or our correspondence courses where you get the material sent to you. But you don't have to come to a physical location. You can receive the teaching through these platforms and then you can send in your test. You actually have interaction and stuff, but you don't have to leave and go to a physical location. And for some of you, this is your answer to how you could receive the teaching from Karis without having to pick up and move to one of these locations. You can get more information by contacting us, but we encourage you to become a part of Karis Bible College through our distance education. Bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app. Free to download, the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive Grace content and explore unique Karis features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study five days a week.